Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 through 4. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, meanwhile praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word, to, sp to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest, so I ought to speak. So Paul supported the Colossian church through his prayers for them in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Their life and ministry would continue to prosper through continued vigilance and prayer, including prayer on their part. The ancient Greek word translated continue is built on the root meaning to be strong. It always connotes earnest adherence to a person or a thing. In this passage, it implies persistence and fervor. And so this sort of earnest prayer is important, but it doesn't come easy. Earnestly in prayer speaks of a great effort steadily applied. We are to be vigilant in prayer, but always praying with thanksgiving for the great things God has done. And so on vigilant here, literally the Greek means to be wakeful. The phrase could well mean that Paul is telling them not to go to sleep when they pray. Sometimes because of the tiredness of our body or mind, we struggle against sleep when we pray. Other times we pray as if we were asleep. And our prayers simply sound and feel tired and sleepy. Uh, the connection here with thanksgiving may suggest the threefold rhythm, intercession, watching for answers to prayer, and thanksgiving when those answers appear. And Paul seemed to say, as long as we're on the subject of prayer, please pray for us. When he goes, meanwhile, praying also for us. So, But Paul didn't ask for prayer for his personal needs, which were many at that time, but that God would open to us a door for the word. The same word picture of an open door as an open opportunity for the gospel is seen in passages like Acts 14, verse 27, where it says, Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, For a great and effective door has been opened to me, and there are many adversaries. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, so even though Paul was in chains for his faithfulness to the gospel, he knew that he ought to speak in a, speak, speak it in a way that would make it manifest or clearly evident. Paul wanted prayer that he would continue to make the gospel clear and evident, even if it meant more chains. So as wonderful as Paul's preaching was to his hearers and seems to us, he was never satisfied with it. What preacher could be? Verse 5 through 6. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So the Christian life isn't only lived in a prayer closet. There also must be a practical, lived-out Christianity, which lives wisely towards those who are outside. How we speak has a lot to do with this, so we must let our speech always be with grace. So the word grace has, in English as in Greek, a, do a possible double meaning of God's grace and human graciousness. In classical writers, salt expressed the wit with which conversation was flavored. Grace and salt, wit or sense, make an ideal combination. So Paul believed that Christians would answer others from biblical truth and that they would work at knowing how to communicate those answers to those who are on the outside. You could translate chapter 4 verse 6 this way. Let your speech always be with gracious charm, seasoned with the salt of wit, so that you will know the right answer to give in every case. So here's an interesting injunction here. It's all, too, it's all too true that Christianity in the minds of many is connected with the kinds of sanctimonious dullness and an outlook in which laughter is almost a heresy. The Christian must commend his message with the charm and the wit which were in Jesus himself. So they must strive to cultivate the gift of pleasant and wise conversation so that they may be able to speak appropriately to each individual with their particular needs with whom they come into contact with. And verses 2 through 6 are going to show that God is concerned both about our personal prayer life and our interaction with the world. He cares both about the prayer closet and the public street, and he wants us to care about both also. And this is also an important idea to connect with the earlier passages in Colossians. Paul spent considerable time in this letter explaining the truth and refuting bad doctrine, yet all the correct knowledge was of little good until it was applied both in the prayer closet and in the public street of daily life. We could say that here, Paul genuinely completes his letter. Verse 7 through 9. Tuhichas, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and f fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, which is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. So apparently the Colossian Christians didn't know who uh, Tuhikas was, 
he would carry this letter to them. Apparently, Epaphras, who brought the news from Colossae to uh, Paul in Rome in chapter 1, verse 7, would not return to Colossae soon. So Paul sent Tuchichas instead. Uh, he is mentioned in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, where it says, And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, and also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tuchichas, and Trophimus of Asia. Um, as he was one of the men who came with Paul from the Roman province of Asia to Jerusalem to carry the offering of those believers to the needy Christians of Jerusalem and Judea. And so the reference to Tuchichas is almost word for word identical with Ephesians chapter 6 verses 21 and 22 where it says, But you also may know that my affairs and how I am doing, Tuchichas, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, uh, will make all things known to you whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. He was evidently the bearer of the letter to the Ephesians as well as this one. Onesimus was a slave owned by a believer in Colossae, uh, but he ran away and came into contact with Paul in Rome. There, Onesimus became a Christian and a dedicated helper to Paul. His story is continued in Paul's letter to Philemon. And Paul could have wrote about Onesimus, the escaped slave who I'm sending back to his master. Instead, he called him a faithful and beloved brother and let the Colossian Christians know that Onesimus was now one of you. Verse 10 and 11. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my fellow, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God, who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. So Aristarchus, he was a Macedonian from Thessalonica, Acts 20, verse 4. We'll say also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians. He was Paul's travel companion and with the apostle when the Ephesian mob seized Paul in Acts 19, verse 29, where it says, So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. So he was also with Paul when he set sail for Rome under his Roman imprisonment in Acts 27, verse 2, where it says, So entering the ship of Adramidum, we put to sea meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. So Paul here is going to call him my fellow prisoner. It seems that Aristarchus had an interesting habit of being with Paul in hard times. Some will suggest that he actually made himself Paul's slave so that he could travel with him on his journey to Rome. And though Paul had a uh, much earlier a fallen out with both Barnabas and Mark in Acts 13 verse 5, where it says, And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. In uh, Acts 13, verse 13, Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. In uh, Acts 15, verse 36 through 40, we will say, Then after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city, where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with him John, called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with him the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. And then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. So clearly, by the time he wrote this, um, everything was in the past. The grace of God working in Paul meant that time changed him and softened him towards others who had previously offended him. And so it is from this reference alone that we learn that Mark was Barnabas's cousin, a piece of information which kind of throws light on the special consideration which Barnabas gives to Mark in the narrative of Acts. And so because Paul identified Mark in terms of his relationships with Barnabas, it seems that the, the Colossian Christians knew who Barnabas was. Either this was through his reputation or through further missionary journeys that were not recorded in the book of Acts. It's going to remind us that the book of Acts is an incomplete record of the history of the early church. But what is recorded is accurate. So of this man, Jesus, who is called Justice, we know nothing except his name. He is numbered among these previous four men, all of them comforters to Paul in his Roman custody, preceding his trial before Caesar. And uh, at that time, Paul only had three fellow workers with a Jewish heritage. Yet these three did a great work, and they proved to be a comfort to Paul. 
Paul was in the Roman custody because of the Jewish riot in the Temple Mount over a mere mention of God's offer to the grace to the Gentiles. That's in Acts 22, verse 21 and 22, where it says, Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from this earth, for he is not fit to live. So these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. So it is evident, therefore, that Peter was not now at Rome, else he would certainly would have been mentioned in this list. For we cannot suppose that he was in the list of those who preached Christ in an exceptional way and from impure and unholy motives. Indeed, there is no evidence that Peter ever saw Rome. Verse 12 and 13. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you, and those who are in Laodicea, and those in Hierapolis. So prayer is hard work, and Epaphras worked diligently at it, especially knowing the danger of the false teaching in Colossae. And so Epaphras prayed that the Colossian Christians would stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Uh, this is a wonderful prayer to pray for anyone. Paul called Epaphras a bondservant of Christ, using a phrase that he often applied to himself, but never to anybody else, except here and in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, where he speaks of himself and Timothy together as bondservants of Jesus. So Epaphras was a bondservant, and prayer was an important area where he worked hard. Laboring fervently is a free translation of um, Achaia Polyan Panon. It's a phrase where the key word of which, panam, suggests heavy toil to the extent of pain. And so Epaphras prayed well because he cared well. If he lacked in zeal, he certainly would, uh, he would have lagged in prayer as well. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So this is the one passage that informs us that Luke, the human author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, was a physician. We also see that his works are written with a more scientific, analytical mindset in Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, and have much detail that a physician would be interested in, such as Luke chapter 4, verse 38, where it says, Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house, but Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made a request of him concerning her. And uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 12 through 15, And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man was full of leprosy, saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing and as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. <clears throat> It's also in Luke chapter 8, verse 43. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. So perhaps Luke was in Rome to deliver a document he recently finished, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, which probably were together as a friend of the court report, explaining to the Romans why Paul stood before Caesar's court. And so Demas, here nothing positive is said about Demas, only that he greets the Colossian Christians and therefore must have been known to them. In Philemon 1, verse 24, he is grouped among Paul's fellow laborers. Yet in the last mention of him, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, Paul said that Demas had forsaken him, having loved this present world, and that he had gone on to Thessalonica. So surely here we have the faint outlines of a study in degeneration, loss of enthusiasm, and failure in the faith. So the six people who greeted the Colossians were connected with Paul in Rome during the time of his house arrest and custody before the appearing on trial before Caesar. This shows that during this imprisonment, unlike the later one that's described in 2 Timothy, Paul, though he was chained, enjoyed at least the occasional company of many friends and associates. Verse 15, Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in his house. So this was the same city that's later mentioned in a scathing rebuke of Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22, Laodicea, the lukewarm church. And it was a neighboring city of Colossae, along with Heropolis in Colossians chapter 4, verse 13. So Nymphus, there's been some considerable debate as to if Paul referred to a man or a woman with this name. Some manuscripts have a masculine form and some have the feminine. Uh, both forms are found in the manuscript tradition and certainly seems impossible on this. Uh, fortunately, not very significant point. So having no buildings of their own, the early church met at house churches. Because few houses were large, there were usually several house churches in a city. 
with a pastor or an elder over each one. So such house churches were apparently smaller circles of worship within the larger fellowship of the city, Ecclesia. And we must remember that there was no such thing as a special church building until about the 3rd century. Up to that time, the Christian congregations met in the houses of those who were the leaders of the church. Verse 16. Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So when Paul and the other apostles wrote letters to churches, the letters were simply publicly read in the congregations. It was a way for the apostle to teach that church, even when he could not personally be there. And so it was a general practice to distribute all apostolic letters among the churches, especially those close to each other, right? See that it's read also to the church in the Laodiceans. Uh, <clears throat> So this helps us to understand how and why the letters would have been copied almost immediately and how slight mistakes in copying the manuscripts could come in at an early date. And so apparently Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans that we do not have. We should not assume that this is our treasure of inspiration is uh, incomplete. The Holy Spirit has chosen to preserve those letters that are inspired for the church in a universal sense. Paul was not inspired in this way every time he set pen to paper. So it may be that this missing Laodicean letter was actually the letter to the Ephesians. And so it is, um, it's certain that the Ephesians was not written to the church at Ephesus, but was an encyclical letter meant to circulate among the churches of Asia. So it may be that this encyclical had reached Laodicea. It was now on the way to Col Colossae. Verse 17, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So this special word to Archippus is of uh, special interest. Paul wrote another short word regarding uh, Archippus in another letter, mentioning Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house in Philemon chapter 1 verse 2. This mention in Philemon chapter 1 verse 2 makes some people believe that he was the son of Philemon, since he's mentioned in the context of the wife of Philemon, Aphia, and his household, the church in your house. It also shows that Paul thought highly of Archippus and valued him as an associate in God's work, our fellow soldier. The context in chapter 4 verse 17 here is going to lead some to think that though Archippus was part of the family of Philemon, he was connected with the church in Laodicea. Perhaps he was the pastor of the church at Laodicea, and of course there's no way to know this for certain. And so Paul wanted Archippus to be encouraged and strengthened, but he did not make this appeal to Archippus directly. He asked that it come to Archippus through the Colossians or the Laodiceans. So therefore, <clears throat> it was more fitting for the Colossians or the Laodiceans to say this to Archippus than for Paul himself to say it to him. He needed to hear this from the people around him, right? Fulfill your ministry. When the Colossians spoke up, then Archippus knew his ministry was wanted. Many in Archippus is sluggish, because the Colossians are silent. So they need to say, fulfill your ministry directly to Archippus, not behind him. Whispering it behind his back would do no good. They had to say it to him. So take heed to the ministry. This encouragement to Archippus spoke both to him and to us regarding some enduring principles of ministry. God gives ministry to his people. True ministry is received in the Lord. Ministry may be left unfulfilled. One must take heed to their ministry in order for it to be fulfilled, and we should encourage others to fulfill their ministry. So thinking Archippus to be a pastor, you can apply the principle of take heed to the ministry. Uh, the church is just a proper element. The pulpit is your right or place. The sanctuary should be the center of all his circum uh, circumference. Verse 18. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. So, as was the custom in that day, Paul generally dictated his letters, and then he personally signed a postscript with his own hand. Uh, remember my chains, there is much emotion, sorrow, and strength in this simple phrase. Paul not only knew the confinement and loneliness of the prisoner, he also had the uncertainty of not knowing if his, if his case before Caesar's court would end with his execution. So, Paul's references to his sufferings are not pleas for sympathy, they are his claims to authority the guarantees of his right to speak. So Paul's conclusion is the only one possible for the apostle of grace. Confronting a heresy, emphasizing elaborate hidden mysteries and righteousness through works, we can only go forward safely in the Christian life if grace is with us.